Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. New week, new theme. This week, we're going to be checking out lyrical dissonance, songs that provide a different atmosphere or emotion or energy than the lyrical themes do. Today, we're going to be starting with a band that we've checked out before, and I was quite intrigued with The World is a Beautiful Place, and I Am No Longer Afraid to Die. The track in question is January 10th, 2014. And yes, the title of the track is Just a Date, as far as I can tell. So let's dive into this and see what's going on. Oh, oh, she got a bit of a tempo pick up there. I love those two bass kicks into the snare. Really drives the energy forward on those. Yeah, really beautiful. We have these uh, environmental things on our right, simple counterpoint on our left. Oh, actually, I got that reversed. The melody's on the left, and some Cermelo pickings on the right. Interesting, we have different speeds of modulation going on here. Metric modulation specifically. Shifted to a triplet vibe here. Really nice resolution there on the right. I can already tell from the music video though, assuming that <laughs> it's going to be a similar lyrical theme. Uh, probably some heavy topics in here. bit of chime there. Grace this song. Really calm and beautiful violin. got the two guitars in that last section with the violin, almost the three-way counterpoint going on. Are you afraid of me now? Well, yeah. I be? Again, we get that little bit of a tempo uh, increase. Back in the entire intro actually just happens. Ooh, what a shift completely driven by the drums. So we got the bass going along with the drum kick, the bass kick, and this really nice counterpoint going on here. Yeah, 
Another bit of metric modulation there on the right. of driving energy right here but it's still very uh bright very pop punk all those vocal harmonies Huh. Okay. Yeah, I actually uh, I dug a lot of that. You know, we looked at uh, the world is a beautiful place a while ago. I'll put the uh, the link up there if you want to check out that reaction as well. Um, but they're sort of like an indie rock pop punk kind of thing. I don't remember the pop punk aspect so much from last time. I remember it being a bit more abrasive. Uh, this one is just very poppy though in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, a combination of sort of the indie rock dual guitar things that are going on, uh, the drum beat, the vocals, and sort of the uh, consonant way that they're harmonizing and the sort of bright energy they're bringing. The large <laughs> amount of major chords throughout this entire track. There's just... Um, there's a bit of an uplifting element. It isn't completely bouncy and positive. There are sections in it that sort of uh, veer towards a little bit of con or sorry dissonance or uh, just overall tension to sort of contrast that upbeat bounciness. And we do have that chill moment in the second to last, third to last section um, that kind of brings the energy down a little bit and kind of just makes it more pensive. But aside from these rare moments, it is sort of this driving, bouncy, popish kind of style of, of music that, like I said, kind of fits right into a mix of indie rock's sonics um, aspect, the way that it's mixed and the tones that the guitar uses with uh, pop rock or pop punk's, we're going to stick with pop punk, uh, pop punk's kind of driving energy and rhythmic cadences. And in that, it's a very pleasant track to listen to, which... I'm kind of figuring is not going to be, I mean, we're in lyrical dissonance week, right? The fact that I feel that this song is so bouncy and upbeat is probably going to clash rather uh, harshly with the uh, the lyrics. So I'm already, I'm already feeling that going to happen. <laughs> but yeah, so there's, there's just a lot of this, uh, this, forward upbeat bounciness in here that I really enjoy. Sonically, this is a very uh, pleasing song to listen to. Um, so let's dive into some of these things though. The first thing I got to talk about is that guitar work. It is all throughout this track and we are constantly given one, two, some, well constantly given at least two, sometimes three guitar parts being played simultaneously and none of them really go all right, none of them are really doing the same thing. And this is something that's really grabbed me in recent rock and uh, yeah, even some metal writing. Uh, you know, growing up in the 90s, listened to, you know, hair metal and uh, early Metallica and some more extreme metal. Um, and a lot of the times your guitarists are just kind of playing the same thing in a lot of areas. Um, you know, they'll split occasionally for maybe a melodic riff, but once the vocals come in, they're back to doing the same thing. And even the bass tends to be doing exactly what the guitar is doing. And this is sort of what I grew up as understanding rock to be. I mean, even when I started getting to my teenage years and exploring my own realms of music, uh, you know, a lot of it was based on radio rock, which kind of continued this idea. A lot of uh, 2000s radio rock was still 
kind of giving both guitarists the same job. And I really missed an entire era of this, uh, this Midwest emo and uh, indie rock stuff that was cropping up where this stuff started to come from. And I'm sure there were other bands who've done it. You know, we've talked about bands in the past, uh, especially stuff in the Prague area, 70s and 80s, where we would have multiple guitarists doing multiple things. But I think the standard uh, for some of these, well, for me growing up, uh, was, you know, both guitars doing the same thing, just kind of hammering home this idea. And this is something we hear in even modern black metal, like the I, this this compositional idea is still running pretty strong today. But I absolutely love hearing all of these uh, indie rock and emo and even some metalcore bands, incorporate or hardcore, I think I should say, um, incorporating this idea of two guitars doing two totally different things. Right, and we've talked about it in a few bands, um, but I don't think I've ever gushed about it as much. And I just wanted to get that off my chest. Like I'm really, really happy that rock is moving into this direction of counterpoint, and I'm hearing it in so many different styles. Uh, like I said, it was something that I kind of missed growing up, and I'm just glad to hear it in in so much more music. Um, but yeah, so we have usually two guitars pan left and right, sometimes a third pan center, then they just are always complementing each other with different ideas. Uh, you know, the one that I remember most is the first one we heard. I don't know why that's the one that stuck in my head. Uh, the right pan guitar was tremolo picking and the left pan guitar was doing a triplet beat, which now that I think about it was the first metric modulation in the song, uh, it was a bit of a polyrhythmic idea, where we had four sixteenth notes. Yeah, four sixteenth notes in the tremolo picking, and three eighth notes in the the melodic playing. So um, yeah, we had a bit of a four against three idea right there. But we would continue to see ideas like this continue to evolve, um, and they're just. One setting up an atmosphere, one is playing a melody. And, you know, that's not how it always played out, though, because eventually the right one would ditch the tremolo picking for these triplet quarter notes, I think it was. So it still has this triplet feel that kind of pushes against that core groove the drum is dropping in the 4-4, four four, but it's not as fast as our triplet eighth notes over in our left guitar. So that created another sort of rhythmic clashing right there that created some really interesting polyrhythms. Um, and the song as a whole would eventually move around and play with three and four based uh, time signatures. And it's just really interesting to hear how sometimes the whole song moves with that and sometimes it's an idea. Two ideas are kind of utilizing two different um, rhythm styles right there. Um, yeah, and then like occasionally, like I said, we'd have a third guitar also. And it's just really neat that at almost any point in the song, you can pay attention specifically to your right headphone. And if you don't really have that skill to zero in on an instrument, the nice thing about headphones and speakers is you can just disconnect the speaker side if you have independent speaker cables, or just, you know, pull one ear off of your headphone, you know, pull it back behind your ear or something like that. And that should help you hear the one side and then, you know, switch sides, right? And, uh, you know, you can hone in on one and say, hey, what are they doing? You check it out. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then listen to the other one. Like, what are they doing? That's pretty neat. And then you put both uh, headphones on, both sides of the headphones, and then you hear how it comes together. And it's just real awesome. Every single se section, you can do that. The song just constantly moves. It's constantly evolving. And there's always something fresh to listen to, which for me, as a critical listener here, analyzing the music is a real treat. Um, I feel like the song is paced very well for my speed of understanding sections, and usually about the time I understand what a section is doing, and I've had a chance to just kind of feel it, we're moving on to the next idea. So it just, it works very well for this situation, but I think also casually it's just a real treat to listen to. Now talking about counterpoint, counterpoint is just two instruments or more playing different things. Usually melody lines though. Uh, another term for it is counter melody, but yeah, it's it's two or more melodies being played simultaneously. 
And the guitars are not the only instruments that get to play around with that. Occasionally we have the guitars with the vocals. And there's two vocalists. So at times... Hmm, no, I was going to say at times we have four melodies going on, but I don't think that's true. I don't think there's ever any situation where both vocals are vo both vocalists are singing different ideas. They're either alternating or harmonizing. So yeah, three melodies tops in these sections. But it's just the way that everything fits together is just very neat. Sometimes I don't think they should. I think that's a production thing. Having all of them separated I think helps a lot as well. Um... But yeah, just the melodic writing and the counterpoint in general across this song is phenomenal. Absolutely love it. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the general vibe and flow of this album. Or, jeez, of this song. So we have... Uh, you know, it starts out and we have the two guitars, we have the bass, we have the drums, we have the vocals coming in. That's pretty much sets up most of the song. And it's just very chill, relaxed, laid back. Uh, there's not too many sections here other than the final moment that really increase any sort of uh, intensity or anxiety in the track. It is, for the most part, fairly positive, fairly upbeatish, and just kind of laid back. Um, a lot of that comes down to the chiller rhythms in the uh, guitars and the drums, but a lot of it also comes down to the chords that are chosen and the melodies played around them. It's just a very smooth song from start to finish. We do kind of jump around between a little bit of ideas. We raise some intensity, we lower some intensity, but it's all comparatively chill right? There are some sections that get a bit more tense. There are some sections that get a bit more laid back, but, you know, compared to something like black metal or, uh, you know, hardcore or anything, this whole song is fairly chill, right? We, we sit around a five or a six, uh, the whole time, maybe even a four, I'd say. It's just a very laid back song. Now we go through a couple of ideas. It's like an A, B, C, we go back to the A because I mentioned that, you know, the intro came back in and then we had that tempo shift up again, identical to the opening of the song. So there's some sort of loop in there. Uh, it felt rather linear to me, though. So maybe like an A, B, C, A, B, D I kind of idea. Um, so like I said, we kind of have our ups and downs uh, as far as intensity. We cycle back to the intro. We repeat the intro, the two intro ideas. I think we even go back into that first verse style and um, we get to the end, though. And this is where the intensity starts to increase. You know, the drums start playing twice as fast. Uh, the drums pull in a lot of tremolo picking on both sides. I think it was the vocals are constantly harmonizing on top of this. It is a very full, very intense sound. And again, comparing it to something more extreme, it is still rather soft. I think would be the way to go about it, but comparing it to itself, we've hit a new high. And since the rest of the song was rather chill, this new high hits, as long as you look at the song in a vacuum. If you come off of this song having just listened to, you know, some extreme metal, no, I don't think the ending is going to feel as intense as I'm talking about. But when you look at just what the song is doing, get, get yourself a palate cleanser or come to this song fresh, uh, your first track you listen to in a day or something like that. And, uh, you know, just feel what the song is doing. That final moment is huge. It is still bright, right? Chord wise. M uh, melodic writing wise it isn't really digging into anything dark or heavy uh, but rhythmically it's getting big uh, voice wise it's getting big all of our instruments are playing together at this part and it actually kind of feels like maybe the production has been pulled in a little bit to make it a, a fair bit more claustrophobic but I might just be misremembering that but it just it's very tense this final moment um, and but, you know, it just kind of eases out of that as well. So the song, as far as uh, intensity goes, we kind of meander around here for a little bit. There's a dip in the middle where it chills out. 
we come back to this moment, we meander, we spike, and we fade out. Um, I think overall, the story, the musical storytelling is done very well. All right? It's a nice little ride that takes us through valleys and peaks and valleys. <laughs> um, and has a nice punctuation at the end that gives a, a nice release or a nice payoff for all the tension building throughout the track. Um, it's just, it's done very well. And uh, the final thing I want to talk about is going to be the vocal work. And I think I talked about this a bit last time we checked out World is a Beautiful Place. It's, uh, oh, yeah, okay, we'll see. I, I might want to dip into the drums a little bit because I love what they're doing here. Right now I want to focus on vocals, though. The two vocalists are rather talented in the style of vocal delivery that they utilize. Both of them use a very comfortable voice. Uh, there's nothing too straining or uh, you know, commanding that I think uh, either one of them are bringing to the table. Uh, like I said, it's very comfortable. It doesn't sound like either one of them are really pushing themselves to sing this part. In fact, I'd probably say both of them are in sort of a, a speaking range. Uh, the male one, at least in particular, I'm fairly sure on. The female vocal might be using a falsetto, but again, just a very comfortable falsetto. Uh, case in point is also the volume of these uh, vocals. They don't feel like they have a lot of volume to them. It just sounds like they're speaking in a singing voice. Um, you know, just kind of speaking in a way that's comfortable for them, in a range that's comfortable. And part of that is what helps the song feel chill and laid back. But the other thing that I find interesting about it is that sometimes it also gives off this element of, uh, you know, low effort. And we've talked about this before with vocals. It's not saying that they're not trying, but it's the illusion of not trying to make it sound so effortless. But part of that sometimes, especially in indie rock, I've noticed is that even if they can sing perfectly in pitch, I feel like they purposefully sing out of pitch instead. Um, a little bit out of tune, that is. And it creates some dissonance in the vocals in some places that is kind of off-putting against all the other beauty in the track. And, you know, now that I think about it, you know, I was talking about the counterpoint and it working so well primarily because the production places all the guitars in different places. And the distance between the guitars helps kind of separate the notes, because I, I did say, I think, uh, that not all of it musically, I think, works well. Uh, it tends to sound okay across the board, but if we went and analyzed in partic or particular beats, I think we would find a lot of dissonance throughout this track. And there might be some hidden tension in here, that is not extremely perceptible on the surface because the song is just done in such a palatable way. But I think there is some grit underneath the surface because of the way that the melodies and counterpoints are, are written or performed. Um, and these this vocal thing is a part of that. Sometimes when they're harmonizing, it sounds gorgeous, and other times when they harmonize, there's just a, a hair bit of difference between their pitches. Uh, at least to me, it seems like they're not using any pitch correction at all in this track. Uh, they really allow the imperfections to be present and shine, and I love that. Especially in a situation like this, where I think most people aren't going to hear the difference. It's just going to sound more human or more raw. They're not actually going to know why. And I think that's it, is that there are moments of uh, intonation problems. Uh, that's just because what, you know, that's what we've always called them. You know, when you play an instrument in a big band, if you're not in tune, that's an intonation problem. It's an intonation issue. But it's not a problem or an issue here. It's just an intonation aspect, I guess we could call it. Uh, but the two vocalists are not always perfectly in tune. They're not util utilizing pitch correction, and they're, allows they're allowing the fluctuations and imperfections of their own vocal cords 
to be present in the song. And sometimes, like I said, that comes across as a hair bit of dissonance. Not a lot. They're not leaning into it like a metalcore uh, guitarist would to get that, you know, that screechy nails on a chalkboard pitch. Um, there, It's just a little bit, a hair bit that sort of colors the harmonies that they're making. And this shows up a fair bit in the guitars as well. Uh, you know, now that I'm retroactively thinking about dissonance throughout the track, while the guitar counterpoint is gorgeous in the way that it works together, there are a few places where, like I mentioned, if you went and analyzed beat for beat, you're going to find notes that just don't work well together. You know, dyads or triads um, that at that moment are creating a little bit of dissonance or even just tonality issues. Again, I say issues, but tonality aspects where the two guitars are playing a note and they're not perfectly in tune with the note they're playing. Maybe the string, uh, you know, got a little flat from playing and they didn't retune it before recording or something like that, but they purposefully left it in there. They didn't try to fix it in post or, or do another take of it. It just kind of left it in there and the whole song kind of has this very human character to it. Um, little bits of imperfection. Uh, all around it and you know I've said this a million times in the past I love perfection in music I think it's a really interesting thing to create especially in songs or styles of music that sort of demand it uh, tech death would not sound very good with bits of imperfection in it it is a style of music that pretty much requires even an inhuman amount of perfection in the playing, which is why I don't mind, uh, you know, producers cleaning up some uh, some notes here and there, you know, attacks or fade outs, anything like that, really allowing the technical aspects of fast playing to be punchy and uh, crisp. But on the other end of the spectrum, I also really love human playing. I love hearing mistakes in performances. I love these little nods, or not nods, but little nuances in the track that tell me that, you know, this wasn't uh, created utilizing any uh, production techniques to clean it up, that they are humans, they make mistakes, and those mistakes can be in the music. And, you know, this is something I've talked about, uh, especially with older bands, recording on tape, and basically taking the best take that they have as a whole group rather than recording snippets individually and uh, piecing together perfect takes that might not have ever existed. You know, a bar, you know, a beat from this take and a couple bars from this take and, you know, something from this take and then, you know, basically crafting a, a take that, like I said, wasn't actually recorded. And I want to reiterate, I don't mind that. There are definitely instances where I really love the perfection um, but other side of the coin, I really dig when we get stuff like this as well. And I guess real quick, I want to talk about the drums because there's this really cool push and pull going on in that opening drum idea that came back later when we re revisited the section, but I don't really think I paid enough attention to the drums in the middle to know if they were doing anything like this, continuing it on. The beginning though, we had this uh, recurring idea of two bass kicks and a snare. And I had pointed out the quick ones, the duduka, duduka, right? Two two bass kicks and then a the snare real quick. But interestingly, this was every other accent. The ones in between had a bit more space between the bass and the snare, or something like or between the two bass hits. So it was like dun duka, duduka, dun duka, duduka. Right, So you have this pocket of sort of pulling back and allowing a lot of space between the bass hits. And then the next section, we kind of rush. We rush right through this, get the bass kicks out of the way and get right to that snare. And it's this push and pull that sort of happens in the song rhythmically a lot in this one section. And of course, like I said, we, we revisit the section halfway through the track as well. And I just really love not only the crispness in the production of this, really allowing these bass kicks and the snares to be accented in a way that you can you can hear every bit of them, every bit of their timbre, um, especially in the faster ones, 
right? There's no bleed over between the hits. There's just enough space where you can hear each of the bass kicks independently and then the snare crack. It's just really nicely done. But it's not just the production of it, it's the, uh, like I said, the way that it drives the song forward by kind of having this push and pull. It keeps the rhythmic aspect of this feeling dynamic. And it's why I could never really get a hold on if the song was really moving with a lot of momentum towards the next section or if it was sort of chill and laid back. And the song kind of feels like both because of that. In fact, now that now that I've realized that there's actually quite a bit of tension in the track from intonation, uh, I can also kind of hear that where even melodically there's a lot of beauty in this song, but there's also some dissonance and uh, atonality that kind of create a bit of dissonance that pushes against the beauty of it. And there's, I think there's this push and pull everywhere throughout the song. And it's something I definitely check out when I listen to the track again, is how much of this duality is present in the song. Because now that I'm starting to think about it, I'm like, yeah, there's quite a few places where I couldn't tell if it was rushing or la or you know lagging, slowing down, or if it was beautiful or um, you know a bit tense, or if it was beautifully tense, or if it was positive or slightly negative or pensive or melancholic. Like it's it some of these some of the parts of this song really do embody uh, multiple simultaneously opposite ideas. And this might have been that one piece I needed to see to be like, oh, maybe this is everywhere. But yeah, that opening drum idea was just really neat. I love how they incorporate both rushing and dragging. Uh, those are extreme terms. It's not <laughs> forward momentum and a lackadaisical uh, drive simultaneously in the same section to kind of achieve this push and pull vibe. All right, I think that wraps that up. Let's get into some lyrics here. Yeah, we got uh, we got two vocalists. Ease the babies out of their wombs. Make your hair blonde. Hop on the number four. Do you become the driver when they drop you off? You don't take their money, ripping out their roots. Okay, we're going to move to the next stanza. Hopefully something clicks because that, uh, that stanza took a big leap from a midwife into becoming a driver into, I don't know. They found two heads hollow. Okay, we just jumped up to 11. They found two heads hollowed out in the sanctuary or on the dry roadside. This is a duel and she won. Congratulate her. Send her thanks. So maybe this midwife person who eases babies out of their wombs. Uh, midwife by day, murderer by night. Um, apparently she got in a duel with some people and shot them. Uh, hollowed out their heads as is stated here and somebody says we should congratulate her and send her thanks who is she and should I be rooting for her <laughs> so far I don't know how great that someone's doing what many of us should have done put up a statue of the new killer out of chains in the waxing moon okay So people, I mean, they, they congratulate her. They say we should put up a statue of her. They say that she's doing what we should do. Do you see my shadow off the stake? Are you Diana the hunter? So is she some sort of, uh, like, anti-hero? Uh, you know, like a, like a punisher? Going out killing the bad guys. So she's technically not right? But people are backing her morally. Like even though her actions might not be great. Because she's out there murdering people. She's doing it for the right reasons. Punisher style. I don't know. 
Uh, are you Diana the Hunter? Are you afraid of me now? Well, yeah, shouldn't I be? Who is Diana the Hunter? I don't know. But apparently people are afraid of her, which makes sense if she's killed people. Uh, but don't you quiver. I am an instrument. I am revenge. I am several women. Well, I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, assuming that she is, like I said, an anti-hero, people get behind her actions, or people get behind her motives, I should say, um, even if they don't necessarily agree with her actions. Uh, we're going to call her... I don't know. We're, I guess we're just going to stick with anti-hero. Um, you know, definitely seen... I'm an instrument. Revenge, I am several... So I am... There, there's an injustice happening to women and she's getting revenge on those who are perpetrating these crimes against the women she says she's an instrument i like this line though but don't you quiver we just got off of the idea of aren't you afraid of me so the quivering but she's also called diana the hunter first thing i think of is a bow and arrow uh so that's a nice little play on words there Oh, actually, continuing this says, follow the arrow from behind the line. So we're keeping on with this idea of bows, arrows, quiver. Follow the arrow from behind the line. Moving forward, the night begins. We are brave and strong, but you don't quiver. Let's write this down together. Uh, so this is about, uh, it seems about bringing together people in this same goal. Because we have we've moved from, uh, you know, shouldn't you be afraid of me? I am an instrument. We have a lot of singular stuff going on, and we've moved to multiple. We are brave and strong. So it's almost like people are rallying behind this person. It says our hands on the same weapon make evil afraid of evil shadow. So yeah, uh, that kind of goes back in line with the idea of the anti-hero, where. Uh, they're utilizing the tools of criminals, so to speak, uh, That's uh, and to make criminals afraid. You know, assuming that there's, like I said, I, I get the idea that women were being harassed um, or maybe even, uh, you know, murdered or stalked or, or raped or whatever, you know, uh, and she is the revenge for these women. Maybe they weren't finding justice and she felt she needed to step in. Um, so these criminals, right, that's the evil. And she wants them to be afraid of their own tools, which is, you know, killing, murder. Interesting. Oh, you know, this, <laughs> I completely forgot about the visual component here of, uh, it looked like a, a dude was picking up hitchhikers and then murdering them off the side of the road. And then the group of women came and uh, murdered him instead. So yeah, I, I mean, I guess that lines up. The music video is semi-metaphorical then, but also very much in line with the same ideas about, uh, you know, women being harassed or, you know, in the case of the, the music video, murdered. And uh, he looked like a repeat offender going for... a um, another victim and instead got killed himself which would place them as this diana the hunter but again that was a bit more of a metaphorical side because that moves into the we right that was a group of women so we are brave and strong taking up the same weapon as this diana the hunter person interesting definitely very different from uh the music like i said it was a bit upbeat chill uh happy-ish uh again happy is not the right word uh, i think emotionally just upbeat it wasn't sullen that's not a word maybe it is a word is that an emotion it isn't sad it isn't sorrowful it isn't uh energetic it's not depressing it's not heavy it's just kind of existing right in semi-positive vibes and then this the lyrics are about <laughs> Uh, this anti-hero who goes about killing people who have 
uh, harmed women and justice wasn't served and a, gr a new group of women who take her up as uh, their hero, putting up a statue of this new killer and uh, taking up her weapon and being brave and strong, uh, you know, under her in a sense. Hmm. Very different, very different vibes. Uh, anyways, those are my thoughts on The World is a Beautiful Place and I Am No Longer Afraid to Die's January 10th, 2014. I need to know what is going on here uh, with the title, right? I think that's my big question here. The music makes sense to me. The lyrics, I'm pretty sure I caught on to at least the general gist of them, but that title, I don't know. <sighs> And the thing is, is it's two, two days away from my birthday, January 12th. Uh, so that's kind of weird. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously I was born before 2014. So it's not like it's uh, a coincidence or anything like that. It's just an interesting tidbit about me, I guess. But yeah, why is that date important? Important enough to, call, to title the song. Uh, you know, drop your comments. If you enjoyed this, didn't enjoy it, anything you want to add on to my thoughts or correct any of my thoughts or just give your own perspective. Above the comment section is a description box and there's a link to Linktree. Take you to this menu right here. has everything related to the channel. You can join the Discord community, help support the channel through Patreon, and also gives you the ability to vote on future themes and songs. You can also find my Twitter in here as well as picking up some merch. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, we have a special selection coming up next. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow. We'll continue on with this lyrical dissonance and check out another special selection. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.